Where I want to go, though, is I want to tell a story about using my network. So when I've always talked to you about the value of building a professional network, usually using LinkedIn, um, but you can use whatever you like. The point is building up a connection, a set of connections of people you know, where no is very loose. It means they decided to connect to you in social media and they sometimes respond to things you post. That is the entire definition. I've told you before how valuable this is. And I've given, there's other shows, Awesome's here. He can point you to them on my YouTube where you can go watch Devin and I talk about how to build a network me talk alone about how to build a network, all the different ways you can go about posting little bits of content or connecting to people or reaching out to individuals in order to have a good network. That's all been covered. What I did is I ran into a problem where I'm like, you know what? It's time to test the network. I'm always talking about building one. Is it worth a shit? Let's find out. So first, the situation. Last fall, October, uh, a friend of ours, one of my wife's best friends, um, needed to unload her timeshare in Maui. Uh, she had owned it for many years and didn't want to own it anymore. And um, timeshares, getting out of a timeshare is a little bit like Spider-Man trying to get out of a trap set by Dr. Octopus. Um, it's not easy. They don't make it easy to sell them because either you have to sell them through the timeshare people at a loss or you sell them privately and they try and screw you over because then they don't get any money. Um, so they don't make it easy. But eventually we hired a lawyer. Uh, so sorry. My wife and I agreed that we would acquire this timeshare from our friend. So to do this, we hired a real estate lawyer in Hawaii to paper the transfer, to write the papers that said, so-and-so sells it to so-and-so for this much money and register it with the state of Hawaii. Okay, so far, so good. We then take this paper and the lawyer files it with the timeshare company, who, as you will learn, is called Vistana. And Vistana was founded by Sheraton and Weston, but is now owned by Marriott. And they were recently acquired by Marriott. Okay, so the transfer hasn't gone through, but our friend lets us go use her timeshare over Christmas. So we go to Hawaii and we take a copy of this paperwork with us. Um, no, you don't need to bad Yelp review them awesome. Not yet. You get to hear the whole story because there's fun. Um, there's fun in this along the way. It truly is a fun story and you're going to see how to really use a network. Um, we can decide later if we need to write them a bad review, but we can discuss that. Okay. So we go there in Christmas and uh, for any of you who've ever been near a timeshare, they love to sales pitch you. So this woman uh, sales pitches us and says, look, you bought this timeshare in a private deal. And as a result, you have limited rights. Like, yes, you can use it and you can definitely stay here and you can trade it like inside our other timeshares under the same brand name, but you can't trade it to other Marriott properties and you can't convert it into points and it doesn't count for elite status when you stay in our hotels and blah, blah, blah. And she was really funny, true salesperson. She says, but if you buy just a little piece from us, I can grandfather your timeshare in um, so that it counts like you always owned it through us. And so it'll have all these rights. And so do you want to buy just a little bit more, like one or two days a year in our network, not even at a specific location? Do you want to buy just a little bit more so that you can get these extra rights? Now, uh, I can hear your eyes rolling through the camera and I have no audio feedback here. It's just, it's actually coming in through the ether. Uh, but we said, all right, 
it, w it wasn't too much money. And we said, all right, we'll bite. Well, now I'm going to fast forward a little. Um, none of this happened. Like we paid the money, but January, February, March, April, the transfer of the condo we bought, the timeshare segment we bought still has not happened. We have the lawyer. So the lawyer filed the paperwork end of November, early December. We handed them the paperwork in Hawaii in person in the sales office when we bought the extra piece because they were like, oh, well, if you buy this, you'll get this. And so we like handed her a copy of the deeds and they're like, yeah, so this is the thing you'll give us rights on. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. January goes by, nothing. February goes by. My wife is like calling, emailing. March goes by. We finally like the saleswoman finally kind of routes us to corporate headquarters and we get on some email thread with a bunch of folks who hide behind a general alias, no names. Nothing happens. March goes by. April goes by. Um, we get an email back that's like, we can't read your documents. We send them as a PDF. Can't read them. We sent them as photographs of the physical documents. Can't read them. April goes by. Still going on. We get into May. Uh, about a week ago. We get into May. And I forget. 40 Pink Dragons is here. She can say what the other problem was. We got like another message from them. It was yet again like, oh, we can't. Oh, I know what it was. The last message we got was in mid-April and said, we can't read your documents. She sent them back in two more formats. And then over a course of over three weeks, she emailed them every four or five days and asked them, so could you read those? Could you read those? Could you read those? No reply at all. Three and a half weeks goes by. We hear nothing. No reply whatsoever. Not, fuck you, we can't read them. Not, we're screwing you and keeping your money. Not, it's all fixed. Nothing. So finally, she comes to me and says, you know, I've had it. Like, I don't know what else to do. And that's when the idea hit me. I said, you know, I'm always bragging about the use of a network. It's time to put it into play. So now let's go to the tape, as they say. Uh, let me make sure when I was playing around. Okay. I'm going to drop that out. Um, we're going to go. Nope, that's not what I want. I'm not interviewing anyone. This is what I want. So... This is what I wrote on LinkedIn to my network. I'll read it to you. You can see it, but it said, need help, please. I need a contact in Vistana, the Marriott-owned Sheraton and Weston Vacation Club. So I told people right up front, what did I need? So this is important. If you're going to ask for help, be clear. What you can do. So then I tell them what I need them to do very explicitly. Again, short. If you know someone there, please message me. If you don't, please consider liking this post a single click to help it get seen. Now, let's talk about results on that real quick. Since I posted this, it's been seen down here at the bottom, you can see, by almost 30,000 people. Um, and 235 people liked it. So, we got it out to a lot of people. Now, I gave them reasons. I didn't just say do this because I'm pissed off and I want to rain on people's parade. I said, why? Uh, I talk a lot about networking before you need help. This is now a test of needing help for my network. I'd love to report back magical success to all of you readers, which I'm going to do tomorrow morning. Because at this point, as of this afternoon, teaser, we have success. Um, Six months ago, we acquired a Vistana timeshare. This tells the story. Uh, we can't even get email contact from them, which was true when I posted this. At this point, I'm simply looking for an actual human in Marriott, Sheraton, West, and Vistana who will reply to an email and help. Um, so uh, this is what I posted. And 38 people commented. Um, some people, like this fellow, were very helpful and say they have a timeshare, my experience sucked too, um, etc. But we have to find the comment that mattered. And this is where um, uh, timeshares are a scam, presentations. Okay. Uh, this is where it worked. So James used to work with me at Amazon. 
And he tags this guy. And it's really funny because if you look at this pop-up, he tagged a guy who actually works at Hilton. Different chain, competitors. And you'll see, he thought he was tagging a Marriott guy. Tagged the guy at a complete competitor. Like totally, boom, missed it. Like shots fired, no one injured. But it turns out this worked out because this Gaithright guy, um, where are these replies? How do I get them to show up? Uh, they showed up. Uh, I got to find where he wrote back. He tagged in some other people. He may have now deleted it. I don't know because he didn't want it on here. But he tagged in someone at Vistana. So we'll have to see if I can find that real quick. Uh, all right. Um, blah, blah, blah. This is still people. Uh, I have to appreciate people. Let me see if I can find. Um, this guy tagged in some people as well. I had a lot of like offers of small help. Um, Someone had a good suggestion. It might have been up here earlier that I should have used Twitter and just added them, which probably would have worked faster. But let me see if I can find this. The bottom line is this guy tagged in an executive at Vistana. That guy I was showing. Uh, where did... He must have deleted his comments after it worked because he didn't want people spamming them would be my guess. Because they were replies to here. This guy is the guy who actually got to the right people. Um, I just want to see if they're anywhere else. I don't want most relevant. I want all. See, all comments. Okay, let me see if I can find these real quick. Load more comments. Because I want to show you the whole chain. Here's a punchline though. Within eight hours, I had an email from their customer service head. Within eight hours of posting this, I had an email from a manager of customer advocacy at Vistana. Um, and then some people sent me private messages as well. I had avenues. I got additional. Um, this guy sent me the name of two executives I never had to reach out to. So I just need to write them a thank you note. Um, but I never had to reach out to them at all. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this guy must have deleted his comments. He tagged in some other people and they're the ones who fixed it, which was great. Um, I appreciate the fact they did that. The point is, here's the key point, the punchline. We fought personally, my wife and I, with this scenario using a lawyer, not suing anybody, but we had a lawyer also, sending the messages also, for six months and nothing happened. I posted this to my network and in eight hours, customer service had reached out to me they had tracked down my email address from my website, I assume, emailed me and said, we got word of your problem. We'd like to help you. How can we get in touch? And then it took six days, which is still a long time, for them to actually fix the problem. So it took a couple of phone calls and whatever for them to actually sort it out and get it fixed. But the point is, um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Major Gaming Geek. It doesn't reflect well on their company. That I had to do that. That's not the point though. You're right. Not the point. The point is why all of you should be working on building a network because frankly, six months of frustration, we got nothing. Eight hours of asking the network for help. I got a phone call from the customer service manager. That is what your network can and should be able to do for you. And that's the proof. 
And this was an obscure request, right? Like, find me. I went out to the random internets and I said, find me someone in Vistana who can make my problem go away. Now, the internet has lots of reasons not to bother. Reason number one. Oh, poor you. You need help with your Hawaii timeshare. I have no time to help with that. Go fuck yourself, rich guy. Reason number two. Timeshares are a nightmare. Nobody can help with that. Good luck, buddy. Reason number three. I'm busy at work. This isn't the usual content you post on how my career can go better. Blah, blah, blah. But none of that happened, right? None of that happened. Instead, eight hours later, customer service manager. She's been great. And that's why when Awesome said we need to write them a bad review, I don't know. Obviously, the company doesn't have their customer service figured out. I did follow up with her, by the way, and say, look, what can I do to save someone else this problem? Like, it, you don't want me contacting you through your executives. You don't want to be contacted this way. Like, what can I do to help? So. Hmm. Uh, so strikes familiar, um, asks, um, did the six months of frustration give me more of a case? Sure. No question. Right. It's a more sympathetic case when I go out to my network and I'm able to say, Hey, look, I've been having this problem for six months. Help me out. Yes. I'm sure that that is, that is a valid observation and it's a good part, but Let's look at this the other way. What would we have done if we didn't have this ability to network in? Now, one of the commenters on my string said, look, try adding them on Twitter, right? So put out a tweet that says at Vistana, blah, blah, blah. And that works pretty well to get attention. It might have worked. But what I'm preaching for all of you is build your network now so that when your back is against the wall, potentially something way more important, by the way, than getting your timeshare ownership untangled. We, If it wouldn't have happened now, it would have happened someday, somehow, maybe. Um, our backup plan, to be honest, was their headquarters were in Florida, and my wife has a friend in Florida and she was going to fly to visit her friend and go into their headquarters and stand at their desks until they fixed it. So we did have a backup plan. But the real point that I want you all to absorb is slowly build your network so that when you need something real, like a job, like help with a crisis, you have people that can find any resource. Um, Okay, and yeah, so the next thing that's going to come up is, well, was I better able to develop a network because of my history and role? And we're going to talk about that. There is some truth to the fact it's my network, which is full of executives, was the right network to go out to in order to reach... Um, Vistana, or to the point, Marriott executives, right? So that, that old boys network, right? In quotes. I understand that. We're going to talk about that. But all of you who watch this channel are going to be rich and famous soon. Whether or not that's your goal, it's going to be a side effect of the great work you do as a result of following your passions and applying the magic loop. So given that you're going to be rich and famous, you're going to have powerful friends and you might as well start accumulating links to those powerful friends right now so that you can use them to do good. I said that purposely in a flip voice, but it's actually true. You have long lives in front of you and networks are built little by little over years. This guy who actually put me on to the right people was an Amazon colleague 10 years ago. He and I haven't worked together in over 10 years, but we've stayed in touch and he had the magic connection. He, and of course, his magic connection was to Hilton. He had the wrong magic connection, but it still worked because the Hilton guy knew the Marriott guy. And that's all it took. So 
Um, I agree, by the way, uh, with the comment in chat of people who try to sell you things. I disconnect from them as well. And someone in chat now, Veeb, is telling a story of using his network exactly um, to get a dream job and to leapfrog other candidates. Hephaestus, welcome in, and thank you for the ongoing sub. I saw also I missed Fighting Pickles with his 100 bits, and Matchstick Man resubbed as well. We have two 21-month subs um, who've uh, weighed in tonight. Um, and so they're both welcome here. PMA Dota, thank you, 12 months. All the old timers ticking in their subs. Bansura Gaming using a Prime sub. Thank you very much. Prime Gaming near and dear to my heart. The team is doing very well, by the way. I hear good things from them. Um, yeah, perfect. So Veeb's talking about he made a contact two years ago. Um, he made a contact two years ago and kept that contact um xx dj xx uh thank you also for the prime sub i love prime subs because i built them with my team oh and they make streamers happy <laughs> level one is complete on the hype train all right so and i love to use twitch as an educational platform so i've kind of wrapped this point up I have other shows which I'm not going to completely recover on how to build a network, but let me give you the really simple right now. Be on LinkedIn or some other social platform. Reach out to one person each day that you know from school, from high school, from work, from sports, from stuff you follow. Send them a note that says, hey, you and I both like Manchester United. We both uh, seem to be in mountain biking. We both worked at Subway. I thought it would be cool to connect and get to know you. Major Gamergeek, thanks for the 100 bits. Um, which I also love because I ran the team that launched bits. And that was fun. Um, build your network. If you do it one person each business day, it's 250 people a year. You're like, yeah, that'll take a year to get to 250 people. Well, sort of. Life is long. Five years later, you'll have 1,200. And that's fantastic. Second, somebody said, how connected are you? Everyone's heard of the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, that Kevin Bacon supposedly was no more than seven links away from every human on earth. Well, in the professional world, as I just proved, I was three links from the right person. I knew this guy, James. He knew the Hilton guy, Mike. Mike knew a guy at Vistana named Ron. And that was enough to get me what I needed. In any particular world, the world is smaller. The second thing is, Kevin Bacon, in this example, that's the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, he's famous, but he doesn't work on networking. He doesn't work on building a network, probably. Maybe he did. I don't know. But if you put a little effort into it, it's very easy in the modern world with modern tools to be this connected. And then to be able to get, oh, six degrees, Kevin Bacon. Even better, Kevin got it down by a whole degree. He's that good. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon. If you're that, it's not hard to become that connected over time. Now, second thing. I posted on this in LinkedIn. If you're not following me on LinkedIn and you want to be at all serious about this, that's where I post most of my networking advice because it's easy. Um, yeah, it's easy to use LinkedIn to build a network. And all you do is offer people a little value. All of you, believe it or not, some of you I know struggle with self-worth and you think you have nothing in your life of value. Well, you're wrong. There's something that you know more about, are more passionate about, and want to talk about that other people are interested in. My network grows every day without me doing anything because I post about topics like this and people link up to me because they're interested. Pick a topic that you're good at and offer people a little value. It doesn't have to be professional. It can be sports advocacy. It can be technology. 
It can be any patient of yours. Um, and people will start to follow you and you will build a larger and larger network. Second, posting occasionally reminds people you're alive. And so my network is active because people see me giving to the community. And so when I occasionally ask for something, they're ready to give back to me. And I'm not doing any of this simply to manipulate them or to have a big network. It's a beneficial side effect. Okay. Um, yeah, Danny Mac. My three job hunting posts have increased my LinkedIn network by 5%. Hmm. Yeah, and Hephaestus put my link up. You're all free to connect there if you want, if you haven't. And you should. You are my community, and I welcome you. And I'm glad you're getting benefit from it. Okay, now there is one topic I want to address uh, because a friend of mine didn't get it, and I'm really sad about that, and I want to talk about it a little. I acknowledged uh, after I made this post and after this customer service agent got back in touch with me in about eight hours, as I said, I was having dinner with my wife and my 15-year-old stepson. And, uh, oh, I have to share my level one hype train emote because that's so important. So choo-choo, there we go. Um, and Mabel's, if you have uh, something you want to post, I don't know what it's from. Um, you can talk to a mod if you need to, if it's a link or something. Anyway, um, what do I want to say here? So... Uh, he said something that amounted to, wow, you know everybody. And how would this work if you didn't know everybody? And I said, well, this is a good point, right? This is where the idea of privilege comes up. I have this great network. And um, uh, interesting. That LinkedIn link should work. You're saying the LinkedIn link doesn't work. Seems unlikely. What link doesn't work? Testing now. Yeah, it seems like. Oh. Yeah, it looks like I'm there. It worked for me anyway. All right. So the point is, I have an easier time connecting to people because I was a vice president at Amazon, and so people are interested in connecting to me. And... Um, there is a privilege effect to that. And specifically what I was discussing with him is that his life is easier because his mom and I are married and I have connections and I can open doors for him. And I said, that's the very definition of white privilege. The fact that for my stepson, I can open doors for him by reaching out to people who might give him an internship or talking to college administrators. And they're not going to change their admission criteria, but you can have a conversation with them and familiarize themselves and blah, blah, blah. And there's ways you can schmooze the system. And we had this discussion and he understood it pretty well. He understood that he comes from a privileged household. So I posted this on LinkedIn and I mentioned the fact that privilege exists. And uh, one of my friends, of course, he didn't post. He reached out to me directly and he said, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand white privilege. I don't understand the idea. What about you having a network reflects privilege? Um, now, many of you who are in chat right now or listening may have your palms over your face. I like the fact he was honest and asked me a question and talked about privilege. So I tried to explain it to him. I said, look, um, you're offended by, first, the term privilege is problematic in that it puts people on the defensive. What people hear when they say, oh, you have white privilege or you have male privilege, you have advantages in society because you're a man or because you're white or in my case, because both. It puts them on the defensive because what they hear is you're an evil bastard, bad guy, oppressor. You're practically a Nazi. That's what they feel accused of. They feel like 
admitting that historically men and historically white men and white people have had more opportunities in America and around the world in many cases is an accusation that they personally are scumbags and racists. That's not true. That's not what's being said. Saying I have white privilege, and somebody says only in Western society, that may be true. I can't speak for all societies. Saying I have white privilege um, doesn't, isn't the same as the person saying it, saying, so you're a racist scumbag. Now, important asterisk on this topic. Sometimes that is what the person is saying. Sometimes people have an ax to grind and they want to tar and feather everyone they feel has privilege, that that privilege was purposefully taken by that person purposefully putting their foot on the other person's throat and ripping it from them. And they want to accuse them and say, you are effectively a nasty little racist because of who you are. Well, I don't agree. And that's not everybody, by the way. We can have a discussion separate from the people who believe that. Um, because the way I look at it is there's just some truth to it. Here's why. I'll run it down for you. I went to school. I went to college. And I went to graduate school. My dad had a PhD. My mom had a master's degree. So for me, it was assumed that I would go to college and going to graduate school was natural. Now we'll go back a generation. My mom's mom and dad were both medical doctors. My grandmother was one of the first female medical doctors in the state of Ohio and probably in, in the nation. Not like she was number 13, I believe, in Ohio. Um, and so probably number 500 in the U.S., roughly, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know. But she was a medical doctor uh, by the 1920s. And for women to be physi physicians in the 1920s was pretty rare. Why was she a medical doctor? Because her father, my great-grandfather, was also a medical doctor, as were her brothers. So everybody was a doctor. Now, my friend said, well, Ethan, you worked hard. You worked hard. You worked hard in your career. You worked hard in school. How is you having a good network as a result of working hard, an example of white privilege? Well, I explained to him first, I didn't have to compete with people of other races to get that job as much because of subtle discrimination. But you don't believe in that. So let's just look at history. My great-grandfather to whom I can trace my educational lineage, got his MD in about 1900, maybe 1890-something. Did he have to compete with African Americans or Asian Americans for admission to medical school? I don't think so. So at some point, you can trace down the lineage of inherited educational expectation and economic success. So, why am I bothering to detail all of this? I'm telling you to build networks, and if you happen to be in the US, and you happen to not be a snowy white male, you may find it a little harder to build a network, or even a lot fucking harder. Do your best anyway. Because it's an asset worth having. I can't fix privilege here. What I can do is tell you that a network is a great defense of building up people around you. That when you're in trouble, you can reach out. And all I'm doing with the rest of the topic is acknowledging that just like everything else, the people in power in the managerial positions at the big companies have an easier time of it. And by the way, that is where privilege comes from. Why did I go to college? Because my parents did. Why did they go? Because their parents did. Okay, you've heard that argument. But then college got me into a good job and got me into Amazon. And then I rose at Amazon. Why did I rise at Amazon? Well, part of it was hard work in college and part of it was hard work I actually did at work. But part of it is 
Almost all the Amazon leadership, they've tried to diversify it. Almost all of tech leadership is white men or Asian men. There aren't a lot of other people there. So I was rising through a hierarchy of me. So I'm just acknowledging that. Okay, I'm just saying it's true. And so now it was easier for me to build a network. And I don't want to discount that. And I want to show people that's what privilege looks like. It's not any one thing. At no point did I put my foot directly on a minority person or a woman's neck and say, you know, you thought you were going to get this job, but I'm a white man and I'm here to tell you you're not. I never did that. Nobody does that anymore, hopefully. But subtly, little thing by little thing, the people I knew, the people I was connected to, the people they were connected to, the expectation of wealth and education they came from, it all added up. I'm just telling you that's how it has worked and that's where the term comes from. And you don't have to be mortally threatened. If you happen to be a white man, God knows I am not against white men being one. Okay, I'm very pro white man in that sense. But we have to be realistic about the fact that we've had a lot of advantages along the way and they're small and subtle usually. But when you add up dozens or hundreds of them, they stack up to be quite a lot. And someone said earlier, I had never said. I had never said. um, Life is long. And Mr. Havat, I don't know you, but you say rich versus poor or Mr. Yeah, Mr. Hervat. I don't know. I read a story recently, may or may not be true, where in India, not white, rich people are buying oxygen concentrators because they can afford them and using them to save their relatives and poor people can't. And so they're buying oxygen concentrators during the COVID pandemic. Yes, wealth enables health. It does. It's happening in India right now, this minute, right now, as we talk, horrifying or not, there is a poor person in India choking on their own water in their lungs. And there's a rich person who's going to be alive tomorrow morning because their family bought an oxygen cylinder or an oxygen concentrator on the black market and saved their life. And that's fucking true. It has nothing to do with white people at this moment. It has to do with who has more rupees. So, yeah, some of it's color, some of it's racial politics, some of it is money. Those things, we can seek to change that, though, over time. I will die, despite life being long, long before this problem is solved for global equity. All I'm saying tonight is if you find yourself, if you happen to be white, male or female, or you happen to be male, white or not, don't be terrified or offended if somebody says, hey, you know, you do have it a little easier than us non-white females in third countries who are third world countries who are poor. They're not saying you're a bad person and an asshole. They're just saying, hey, you've had it a little easier. Maybe if you get a chance, slide us a break. Seems like a reasonable request if you can. So, That's been a good talk. Questions, comments. I'm not using the question tool tonight. Oh, and Mr. Ravat, I didn't take your question uh, badly. I just wanted to be clear. You're absolutely right. Wealth is a big part of it. So. It's pronounced Kevin. Now that shit's funny, Quentin. Uh. <laughs> How do I platform better financial education? That is a tough question. Whoa. I don't know the solution to that. It's a hard one. Um, I mean, look, we do it here and it's working. LinkedIn's a good place for it. Um, it goes wide and broad. Fighting Pickles, thanks for the extra hundred. You folks are great. And what we do here, we solve it a little bit at a time. That's why we're building the mentor network. 
It's why we're building it um, so that uh, we can invest in people, give mentors a chance to share what they know and meet other people and build their networks, give mentees a chance to learn and grow and grow their networks. And over time, look, you want to have a huge network. There are 120 people watching this right now. You're a network right there. There's 1,000 people in the Discord server. That's a network. There's 7,000 people who follow me or roughly on LinkedIn. That's a network. You can join those networks, add value to them, and get to know people. And build that network so that you, A, learn and can grow in your own life, and B, um, have people to rely on and to help you and to cheer you on. There are a lot of good people in this community that volunteer a lot of time to make sure this show happens and the community grows and to cheer you on. And they're here in chat, a lot of them. All right, let's see what else we got going on in chat. Earlier you commented on how you kept in touch with an associate from 10 years ago. How do you keep a professional relationship alive that long? You know, so I knew him at work, not super well. He came back to interview once, and I talked to him when he came back in to consider rejoining the company. Uh, it didn't work out, but I saw him in person. I've seen him in person once in 10 years. I kept it alive on LinkedIn because we share interests. He thinks what I post is cool. I think some what he posts is insightful. So occasionally I drop a like on something he posts or a comment. That's all it takes. Keeping that relationship alive for 10 years has probably cost me two hours of time in 10 years, maybe. Maybe one hour. Just to give you, it doesn't take that much necessarily. Um, when you say you kept in touch with the guy who pointed out to you the right person, what does that mean? Yeah. What does keeping in touch look like? It just means sharing a social media presence, commenting on some of his stuff occasionally. And I sent him a couple people. Hell, I probably, I kept in touch with him by using him in a, in a good way. I sent him a smart guy and said, hey, this guy's looking for a job. I think you're better off to talk to him about what he needs. You want to talk to him. I can't remember if that guy took that job or went somewhere else, but they had a good conversation and my friend James felt like I'd send him a good candidate. So that's keeping in touch. And in that situation, I was keeping in touch with him while doing this other guy a favor and kind of doing myself a favor by connecting him. Like everyone won. I got to feel good about helping the guy out. The other guy got a connection. My friend James got a candidate for his company. Like everybody won and the cost was almost zero. All right. Let's see. Um, Okay, missed a stream. Any other comments? Are you the biggest? What are the biggest networking mistakes in your experience? That's a good question. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the cert on Ethan Evans VP seems to be expired. Damn it. All right. That pisses me off. But thank you, uh, DJXX. It's usually a cert on some of the images, but I don't doubt you. Um, uh, okay. Anything else? How do you balance the need of diversity and good fit of skills and culture? Could Sunder Pichai rise through the ranks for his 20 years ago? Yeah, boy, good question. Fair question. Um, yeah, no, a like on a post. Look, people, a like does some, a comment, huge amounts. Um, Danny Mac, feel free to share your opinions. Uh, but yeah, just commenting on people's posts or giving them a like, reaching out to them. If someone doesn't get a lot of likes, they will notice LinkedIn tells me, tells me every single time someone likes my post, my phone goes off on every single like and I see a notice. And so I notice whose names come up a lot. And if they comment, I reply to the comment. I go back and like their comment and sometimes say something back. It's just social nicety. It takes a few seconds and it keeps me connected to all those people. And it worked. If you just joined the show, go back in the show and remember this shit worked. We solved a problem that regular methods hadn't solved in six months. We solved in six days elapsed time and in eight hours to first contact.
So it worked. Okay, so this question, biggest networking mistakes. Um, well, number one, building up a lot of likes and then saying stuff on your network that gets you unliked or unfollowed. And I'm not saying, by the way, moderate all your opinions. I'm here talking about white privilege, for example. It's a hot topic. Some people will unlike me um, uh, because I talk about anything like that. You have to decide what you want to stand for. But don't post a bunch of spam. Uh, don't reach out to your network trying to sell them shit in big blasts. Don't throw your politics in everyone else's face all the time. Um, those are three big mistakes. Don't post a bunch of radical shit unless you really want to be radical and try to at least understand what positions are radical. Um, and if you decide you're willing to live or die over a radical position, uh, that's fine. Position it carefully to your network and say, look, I have a strong opinion on an unusual topic and I would really appreciate it if my friends would consider what I have to say and then write a rational defense of it. I could write a rational defense of almost anything. But the biggest thing that will cost you a network is throwing up a bunch of distasteful things broadly with no personal commentary. I happen to be Christian. I have no problem hiding. I don't hide my Christianity. But when I post something that talks about God, which is rare, I'm very careful to explain why I'm talking about God. And then I don't go on and on about it to people who don't care about it. Same thing, politics. I rarely talk about politics, but when I choose to talk about politics, I try to do it in a way uh, where I'm explaining why I'm talking about politics, not just, oh, so-and-so politician said this good thing. You should love them or you're stupid. You're going to lose a lot of people over that. Those are the big networking mistakes. Now, you may have meant one-on-one -on -one networking. Um, big mistakes in one-on-one -on -one networking. I posted about this on LinkedIn a few days ago. Cold reaching out to people with an ask. Hi, Fred. I see you work at Acme Inc. We've never met, but I really need a job. Can you get my resume to the right person? What's wrong with this? Well, it's a completely cold intro. Second, you're asking Fred to do a bunch of work. And third, you're asking Fred to do work that Fred may not know how to do. You're saying get my resume to the right person. That's a super general high lever request. I'm going to ignore that. Um, when people reach out to me with a specific request I can handle, I'm much more likely to do it than if they're like, hey, Ethan, I really need a job. I see you talk a lot about jobs. Can you review my resume and help me network? No, fuck off. And it's not because I don't spend my time like I do here volunteering to help people. It's because you're putting everything on me. You have no idea who you want to network with or why or what your resume needs. You're just totally like, do, do, do for me. That's how you burn a network is asking for something without giving. And I just posted about this. Let's go find it. Hold on. It's out here somewhere. It's like Mulder and Scully from X-Files from long ago. The truth is out there. Okay, post. Let's find this post because I just did it. See, again, if you're reading LinkedIn. All right, here we go. This is what I said about it. Let's bring it up real quick. This uh, is how to screw up a network. Reach out to a bunch of people and ask them for something. is isn't networking, it's sales. Um, I frequently ask how to network effectively. The key to understanding is you have to be a partner, not a taker. You have to be offering to give of yourself in some way. Um, people back themselves into a corner where they reach out with an immediate request for assistance. Um, usually I need a job or I need a reference, but there can be others. Um, asking, this is the key, this is the mistake. Asking someone who doesn't know you to give you something of value, their trust, their reputation, their time, 
is not significantly different than asking people for free money. Now, some people, if you go beg, will give you free money, but most people won't. So do better than that. Okay, uh, Innovate Robert, you said post more on LinkedIn, uh, or sorry, post more YouTube videos. We're gonna do that. I had to make more content. That's why I'm back tonight. So uh, for the editors and for 40 Pink Dragons, I think this video actually should become three YouTubes. There can be one short one on the status of the video, ne uh, the mentor network. There can be one longer one on the utilization of a network and how we used it to get a result. And then the third segment, which is um, privilege in the formation of a network, and then this discussion about how to create a network. So I think there's three videos that come out of it, and so there'll be three to come. Um, huh, fixing mic issues. Yeah, the silent video. It's a silent film. It's a throwback. We'll, we'll do it in, um, we'll have it rendered in black and white. I'm sure one of our editors, maybe even you, Awesome, can re-render that. We'll do it as a silent film. You can add Awesome. This You do some of our editing. So this is now on you. I want that video in black and white, only the silent portion, totally in black and white, with subtitles. And if you can find some that's clearly royalty-free and won't get me a DMCA with a little music. But that would be fucking funny. So, all right. I finished the drink, and that's usually a sign that things had 4-3 resolution. Nice. Twitch staff weighing in from the lurker position. I love it. Good to see you here. Mm. Hey, teaser. I won't say who I talked to, but I know Twitch is very eager to one day hold TwitchCon again, and I'm very excited for that. I don't know anything about dates. I just know they're very eager, and I am eager to be there. So I hope I get to see some of you there. All right, let me see what else came up in chat, if anything. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I get the concept of authoring something, giving something. Can you give an example of the approach? Sure, Innovate. Um, so my favorite example of this is a guy at Amazon who ran the free ski ticket program. Uh, not free, discount. He liked to ski. Early in Amazon history, he went out to the different ski slopes. He started buying group tickets at discount and reselling them internally. He got to meet all the people who bought ski tickets from him. Now, when that guy needed something, he was attached to lots of people in an email list who thought positively, positively of him because he was getting them cheap tickets to go skiing. So he was serving himself, right? By reaching out to these mountains and getting discount ski tickets, maybe he got himself totally free tickets. I don't know. Maybe he only got discounts for himself. But definitely he liked to ski and was benefiting from it. And in the meantime, by reselling them to other people at cost, right, he was making friends with lots of people who are like, hey, this guy's a pretty good guy because he helps me out. So when that guy asks for help and says, hey, everybody, I'm looking for a new job internally, or hey, I'm stuck on this tech problem, a lot of people are going to recognize him and go, oh, that's the guy who hooks me up with ski tickets. I'll give him a hand. That's the brain dead easy example that requires no specific skill. It just required that he, I don't know him well, and I don't want to malign him, but let's assume all it really required is him to be scheming in his head and think, you know, if I got a bunch of tickets on group discount from the local ski hill and sold them off internally, I could use some myself and that would be cheaper. He might've been totally self-serving. I don't know. And yet he built a network off of it. And by the way, a big network who's was well known in Amazon back in the day. So that's one example. There are other ways. Post something of your expertise. You do something you're good at or something you care about or just curate other people's stuff. Go and say, I've taken an interest in reading about whatever, uh, chess matches played in the South Pacific or um, uh, 
I have a real interest in comic books from the 1970s. Whatever your passion is, there's someone else who cares about it. And you can build a network by being interesting about it. Hey, I've curated. There's one guy um, in our Discord server who posts all the links on COVID and what's going on around the world. He hunts up the most interesting COVID news. And he's like our COVID news reporter. He filters down the most interesting stuff and shares it. Well, I value him for that, and I assume others do. And I assume he's doing it not because he wants to be known as the COVID news guy, but because he cares about him himself and he's curious. And so just for doing that, um, he gets a lot of, he builds up a following and people that he talks to and are interested in him. By the way, I should say, if you haven't followed the channel, please follow it. I saw the mods have posted the Discord, join the Discord. But if you haven't followed, uh, you can't chat if you don't follow. It's follower only chat, keeps out the trolls. But if you're watching, please follow. And yes, he also, we also get posts of gorgeous beaches in Venezuela. That is true. All right. I'm running out of steam and I've run out of drink. So soon we will do a stream on um, what we need for programming help to build the mentor network. And soon we will do a stream with a house tour. So we'll get on, we'll get on mobile and we'll do a tour because we have good, good signal here. And we'll do a stream of that. But if you take nothing else away from this show, please advance your careers by having a network that can help you so that you have time, money, and inner peace to go help other people. That's the whole plan. I say unabashedly all the time, the plan on this stream is help you with your career so that you don't worry about your house and mortgage payment, so that you um, can then have time to be a mentor or to contribute in some way, either in this community or another, to help other people. It is totally fine, in my opinion, to do well for yourself while doing good for others. There is nothing wrong with that. Now, there are a few saints who do poorly for themselves and give away everything and do really good for others, and God bless them. There just aren't enough saints. And so I will leave it to the ministers to call you to sainthood my job is to call you to wealthy patronage of others. And you can pick your path. If you want to be a saint, truly God bless you and I want you to be. But if you simply want to be a generous person with a great career, this channel is about helping you get there. So with that, I'm going to call it a night. I'm not sure when I'll be back on yet, but I'm done with the, the move. So I will be back sooner than three more weeks. And I will see all the mentors in mentor special session on Zoom tomorrow where we'll learn about your problems and try and improve things. And so with that, everybody cheers. And I appreciate you all very, very much. Have a great evening.